This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting now in the midst of a pandemic. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times bestselling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. In episode 12, we talk about what kids can learn from a tense election. So I think we all feel it. The tension that is somehow in the air that everyone feels with the election just a week away, Lisa. Yeah. It feels like it's sort of permeating everything from friendships to, you know, family. I think everyone's on edge. And we got this letter from this mom. It just absolutely perfectly sort of sums up where so many of us are. It says, as we approach the upcoming presidential election, would you have any suggestions, talking points and resources for how to talk with teens and young adults about how to respectfully listen and talk to each other about difficult topics where people may have differences of opinions? Our teens and young adults have been exposed to so much lately with the state of our country. Between COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, and the political climate, they have a lot on their minds and hearts. I'm thinking it would be helpful to have some tools for how to talk about these difficult topics, both at the family dinner table and at school, either in the classroom with the presence of educators or even just among their friends. What should they say? Okay, that is a great letter and could not be more on point in terms of what parents are worrying about right now, you know, what we want to help our kids with right now. Where do you take it? Because it's just everyone is so on edge right now, right? It's pretty intense. So, you know, where I like to take it is to the research, <laughs> to, you know, to what we know <laughs> from, from the academic universe. And I am so interested in this topic. And what I want to actually think through here is some work on civil discourse which is basically the ability to have a fair and rounded conversation with somebody who does not share your views. And Rena, I think you know that one of the hats I wear is that I'm a consulting psychologist to a school in my community in, in the suburbs of Cleveland here. The school is called Laurel School. And one of the roles I hold there is with a research center called Laurel Center for Research on Girls because it's a girls school. But we research all sorts of things. And my extraordinary colleague, Dr. Tori Cordiano, is the director of Laurel Center for Research on Girls, or LCRG as we call it. And one really beautiful body of work that has come out of this research center is thinking about civil discourse. And what the team there did is we pulled together all of the relevant research that we thought about what do kids need to be able to do? Like, what are the actual developmental skills the kids need in order to be able to have a civil conversation with somebody who disagrees with them. And and what I love about the way this got thought through is that it is about components and it's about building those components over time, you know, breaking it down and thinking, what can adults do? What can we as parents do to cultivate sort of the component skills that would make having a tough conversation possible. And so I want to share the thinking that came out of this. And if people are interested in accessing more, I'll put in the show notes where people can get more information about um, what we'll talk through. But what we arrived at is this idea that there are building blocks in a couple of categories. And the first category is the emotional skills needed to have a civil conversation that can be really tense. So when you have someone who is coming from a completely different perspective, how do you get kids to deal with that? Okay. So the first emotional skill that we thought through is this idea of empathy. And, and you know, that part of how people can ultimately have a civil conversation is they have to have the capacity for empathy. They have to be able to think about another person's position and to um, – be mindful of that person's feelings and, you know, to care how the other person feels in the conversation. This is an important part of civil discourse. But you know, Rena, I mean, sometimes getting kids to have empathy is a job, right? I mean, it's something we're working on in parenting 
Are you kidding? Sometimes getting adults to have empathy, <laughs> that's even harder, I would argue. Well, and that actually is part of what we're up against here, is that we're saying, like, we want our kids to have civil discourse, but they're not necessarily looking at the best adult models in this. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, when you put it that way, what it makes me realize is maybe that's sometimes how we can do some of the teaching, is if we see people, if we see adults doing this in an ugly way, one jumping off point might be to say, here's the problem with this conversation, that person is having no empathy for the person they're talking with. Mm -hmm. And that's the first step. So you tell the kids, you help them identify how empathy, seeing what the other side might be thinking or feeling could be constructive in having that tense talk. Absolutely. That's a, that's a key element of a successful, difficult conversation. So how do I teach my kids that? Like, how, how do you teach them to be empathetic if they're seven, if they're in elementary school? So first we wait for them to do something dumb, <laughs> which, which they will do, um, either in front of us or to us, right? Say something that's off the cuff or mean or not kind. Uh -huh. And if the moment is right, we actually stop and say, okay, now wait a minute. How do you think that made me feel? Or how do you think that made her feel? That's it. That's the whole thing. And, and doing it in a way that's not so um, angry that it just frightens a kid and shuts them down, but actually does sort of create a teachable moment there. And mm. there's a lot of teachable moments in parenting. And, and so this is what we're thinking through. Like, what are the teachable moments of getting kids to be able to, you know, disagree in civil ways? And you can't turn everything into a teachable moment because that would just make kids bananas. But we should look for them and look for them, especially around this topic right now. So... You know, I'm also walking away. Every time I talk to you, I feel like the whole robot parent, like you've got to take your emotions out of it, even though you are so probably on emotional level, number 10, when you deal with certain things, you know, everyone is just so tense. When you talk about empathy, what else have did you find from this research that really makes a difference in giving kills, kids that skill set? So another thing that's really important, and we've talked about this in various ways, is actually the ability to tolerate emotional discomfort. And the problem with controversial conversations is they make us uncomfortable. And if you can't manage that discomfort, you're not going to be able to have a hard conversation. And so giving kids skills and modeling kids skills, and we can think through what this would look like in real life, for being in a conversation, not being altogether comfortable in that conversation, and yet being able to tolerate it is critical if we want kids to be able to have civil discourse with one another. So what does that look like then in real life? How do you get them used to being in and tolerating being uncomfortable? Well, I'm thinking back actually, you know how we had talked a while ago on a few episodes ago about not having really hard conversations when people are too upset or too mad, you know, letting kids walk away and come back when they've got themselves together a little bit. What I'm thinking is, you know, family life and certainly pandemic family life when we're together all the time and there's plenty of conflict probably gives us opportunities to say, do you feel like you can have this conversation right now? Are you tense but able to do it, too tense to be able to do it? So it's, it's not necessarily like here's the magic of like how you'll mm -hmm. be able to bear all conversations, but getting kids to start to be self-reflective of I'm tense but I can stand it. I'm too tense, this won't go well. I think that's the day-to-day -day of how we help kids gauge how uncomfortable they are and their ability to tolerate it. And maybe, and maybe this feels a little bit aspirational, opens up the door to say, look, I think we should have this conversation right now. What would make it more bearable? You know, would mm -hmm. it help if we didn't look at each other? <laughs> would it help yeah. if yeah. we shared a cookie while we had it? I mean, who knows? Yeah. You know, when I think about this, uh, like what about Black Lives Matter, for instance? I think a lot of parents want to have a conversation with their kids about it. We all come from certain perspectives. We want to do the right thing and, and make them aware. Uh, but at the same time, you feel kind of frozen because some people just don't know how to approach race, especially if you were brought up a certain way. Ooh, right. Okay. So there's one where talk about accepting discomfort and talk about extending empathy, right? To, to have a conversation across race or about race, um, enormously difficult. So I come into this as a white woman, 
um, very aware that my experience of talking about color and my experience of being a person in this country is enormously different than people who are non-white. Rena, you're non-white. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm South talk Asian. Talk to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you know, I'm South Asian. My parents are from India, obviously have a different perspective, the children of immigrants, but I'm a person of color, but I'm not a person of all color. You know, I'm not black. And in fact, this whole concept of race in America really got to me as a journalist to where just last week I launched a show on YouTube called The Rebound, where we're looking at different issues. And the first episode is of a former NFL player who's black that faced police brutality and managed to rebound out of his worst moment. I'll have the info, the notes um, in our, our show notes, how to find it. But this guy... It's almost like a textbook for what you're saying. He developed empathy. Like when he tell now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't know this before when I taped it, but he developed some sort of empathy almost for the police officers. Now that I'm thinking huh. about it, and I think that's what changed. He he's not a man of hate and anger anymore. But it took him a long time. And by the way, it was ruled uh, intense brutality. The officer was stripped of his badge and can't work anymore. Um, it was ruled you know overwhelming force. Um, but it's interesting, like these, these things that you're saying to me about empathy, uh, yeah. what was the second one? Tolerating emotional distress. And tolerating distress. So you're talking about a man of color finding empathy for, you know, I think, was it a white officer? It was a white officer. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I didn't get into whether he's forgiven him or any of that, but I think how do you get out of that horrible moment, right? Where you don't feel good and, and create something positive. And I think these conversations we're having in America, it, it puts us in that place, as you say, of, of discomfort. It does. So let's talk about talking with our children about race and moving into those conversations. And the first thing I think that's hugely important to acknowledge is when we talk about deciding to talk with our children about skin color and its meaning or race and its meaning, that decision, that that uh, the latitude to opt into that conversation belongs to white people. That, from what I understand, families of color, this isn't an optional conversation that you're having. That it's so atmospheric um, that it just becomes woven into family life to have these conversations. Whereas when we're talking about people choosing to have these conversations, we're by and large talking about white families choosing to have these conversations. And I have a way to think about how we can enter into this discussion with kids. And the framing that I like or I'm using right now has broad application, um, regardless of who's having the conversation. But I will also say I'm very open to the idea that I have a lot of room to grow still in my thinking on this. I welcome push and challenge to how I'm thinking. But the word I like to use to get into this conversation with kids is the idea of belonging. It's a word that kids understand even as young as age three, we can start to talk about belonging because three-year-olds are actually keenly aware of feeling left in or left out or leaving other kids out or feeling that they themselves were left out. And so we can start having conversations about belonging and even using that word even before we get into questions of skin color and race, that kids know what it feels like. And even three, four, five, we can continue to move along those lines and talk about who in any setting feels they belong or being made to feel like you don't belong. And also pointing out when our kids do things that make other kids feel like they don't belong. And then as kids get into elementary school, I really like to continue to talk about belonging because they start to sometimes become sort of clubby and sometimes sort of exclusive. (laughs) And so what I like to say to kids, and you can start this, it depends on your kid, but definitely some point in elementary school, you can start to say, look, in any situation you're in, your belonging may feel higher, low, or somewhere in between, right? So, I mean, like when you're hanging out with a bunch of female journalists, right, your belonging is very high, right? <laughs> um, or just moms, right? Or just There's moms, definitely right? definitely a pack with the moms, for sure. Do you have an Indian community that you stay yes. connected to? Yes. You know, and, I, and growing up, my parents did as well. They're from Kerala, which is South India. And they had, it was maybe about seven or eight families at the time, which is, but it's just grown. There's there's probably hundreds now in Tampa uh, from Kerala. But yeah, no, I think that offers people a sense of community. 
So, okay, so in those contexts, right, your belonging would be very high. Um, if I'm hanging out with a bunch of psychologists, my belonging is high. If I walk into a room where I'm the only woman, my belonging feels like it plummets. So one of the concepts that I actually like to put forward with kids is almost this idea of like a belongometer. You know, that we all have <laughs> belongometers that go up and down all day. And so I think that we lay the groundwork for these harder conversations by introducing this idea of a belongometer. Like, where do you feel you belong? Where do you feel left out? And what is quite useful, I find, about this is everybody knows what it feels like to not belong. You know, that this is a universal experience. Mm -hmm. And this Absolutely. gets to the empathy idea, right? Like, right away, you say the word belonging and not belonging, like, empathy arrives. Yeah, yeah. Then... I think what we can do is we can start to push kids as they get maybe late elementary, middle school to say, I want you to pay attention to your belongometer, and I also want you to pay attention to everybody else's. Like any context you're in, who is high, who is low? And if you are high and know that someone else is low, it is on you to try to raise their belongometer. And do you offer them suggestions on how they raise the meter? Yeah, I think you should. So like if we imagine, so if we bring it then back to questions of race. So if we say, okay, you're in a class, you're a white kid, and 80% of the kids in class are white, or 90% of the kids in class are white, you need to be minding the belongometers of the kids of color, and you need to be going out of your way to make it clear that you want them to feel a strong sense of belonging as you do. But I think that's that's great in theory. But if you're white and you want us and you really have it in your heart, and you want to reach out to a black kid at school, it can be hard if your whole group is white, right? And how do you make that authentic? And how do you teach them to be comfortable with it? So it's not something that's forced, right? Yeah, no, I think this is probably a lot of conversations where yeah. you say, what would this look like? How could mm. you do it? Mm. Or even to really recognize that there are things that happen that injure the belonging of others in ways we don't mean to, right? Like mixing up the names of kids who, you know, this happens, right? Kids of color will tell you all the time that, you know, fellow students or teachers will mix up their names with other kids' names. And the teacher's experience or the other kid's experience might be like, oh, I mix up people's names all the time. Yeah. But if you're a kid of color... You feel it. You feel it in you a different totally way. You totally feel it and it stays with you. So Lisa, if you were to walk us through, like let's say we have these building blocks of civil discourse, what would you say, if, if you had to go through the list, like what are the skills and then like what are the emotional skills and what are the, the things that we need to counter with them? Okay, so you definitely need empathy. You definitely need to be able to tolerate um, you know, a fair bit of discomfort. You have to be willing to have a hard conversation. You have to be brave, right? So bravery yeah. is probably in there. And you're talking about bravery when you're talking about like how do we extend ourselves um, if our if our peer group isn't doing the same. Um, then we also can think about some of the cognitive skills. Like you need to be curious, like curious about other people, right? And this is where the belongometer kind of weaves itself in because – if you or I walk into a room and we're like, okay, my belongometer is really high, like for whatever the context is, it's really high. If I then take the step or you then take the step of thinking, okay, but what about everybody else in this space? That's our curiosity coming to bear, right? Coming to sort of be curious about other people's experience of being in the same space, which we don't always do a good job on, right? We're often very caught up in our own moment and so are kids. And and we just need to do better. And and especially elections this tense right. remind us, like, it's this tense because there is so much misunderstanding. And we don't always understand or don't try to understand where other people are coming from. And things get really rigid in that yeah, place. They do. They absolutely do. Um, as we talk about this, you know, I want to tell you one of the sweetest stories that I, I, I really – grasping for anything that makes me long for an America where people really work together is Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia, who despite how they were at opposite ends of the spectrum, the two of them took a trip to India and hmm. they, they, there's a great photo of them on an elephant that I absolutely love. I'm going to post it on my Instagram feed. I think I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more, but it, it talks sort of about how they went out of their way to 
engage each other socially outside of the court, even though they couldn't be more further apart. And everyone talks about how wonderful Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, and I don't ever want to take away from her career and her life, but boy, the two of them together, it's like the Scalia, the Ginsburg Scalia method, you know? Yeah, of, whatever they got going yeah, there, right? Yeah. We could use more of that. Yes. And that, okay, so that, you know, you need to be able to engage, right? Like, and have ways to engage in it. And I, I don't know as much about this as I should, but didn't they also like go to theater a fair bit they together? They did quite a bit. They had a like pretty active social life and enjoyed each other's company, even though they couldn't have been more uh, on different sides of the court, right? Well, so then if we think about, okay, helping kids build civil discourse skills and helping kids really think about belonging, it really does get into these questions of in what ways are kids engaging kids who do not share their views or who are not, you know, very similar to them? Are they on the same teams? Are they doing the same after school activities? Are they being invited to the same out of school events? Right. That idea of of staying connected, not getting so siloed, which, of course, is like nearly impossible right now in the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be mindful, not just of the settings our kids are in that are formal, but do kids have ways that they are with other young people that don't share their perspectives or don't share their experiences on a regular basis, right? Like that's what's so worrisome yeah. is when there's no contact with people mm -hmm. who have different lives. So if you have to wrap this up, Lisa, what would you say is really important as we are entering what could be a really difficult period for our nation? How do we break this down and, and have our kids ready to deal with the tension that could be coming? Whew. I mean, I think a lot of empathy, yeah. a lot of perspective taking, you know, and then once we get into something like electoral politics, you can take that belonging idea. And then this is where it gets exciting for me. You get kids who are 14, 15, 16, 17 and start to think about what are the structures in our society that make people feel they belong, make people feel they don't belong. And, and I think a lot of however this election goes down, I mean, we're going to see those structures really exposed. You know, who feels in, who feels out, and how does that happen fun functionally at scale, right? And, and I have yeah. to say, I don't – my mind doesn't work well at that level. Like, I am so much person to person, but I, I really tried to push myself to think – you know, when we say say things like systemic racism, right? Like the systemic part of it, I have to think really hard to see and watch. And it's a lot of learning for me and I'm trying to do it. You know, what are the systems that make people feel in or out? And, and I think that's how we can think at the, you know, political electoral level and, and ground it in something that kids should get about belonging or not belonging. Yeah, I think we all want to do right by this and have these conversations, but sometimes it's just hard to know where to start. So, so grateful. And and I know we're going to keep talking about this more and more. And please send us your, your emails because they really help in crafting this podcast. Um, Lisa, tell us what you have for children everywhere. So what I have for us today actually fits perfectly with what we're talking about. It's an organization that was founded in 2008 by retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, it's called iCivics. And it's ICIVICS dot org. We'll put it in the show notes. And it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that provides online games and lessons to help kids learn how to do civil discourse cool. and also become active citizens. So that seems exactly where we all need to be right now and we're yeah. thrilled to support them. I, I wish they had more civics education in school, especially when I was in school. But I think this is great. We'll check it out. Thank you. You bet. And so to wrap it up, what do you have for parenting to go, Lisa? So let's stay on this theme, especially as we come into, you know, the week of the election. And I think our goal as parents should be to continue all the time to try to cultivate our kids' ability to take another person's perspective. And when kids are feeling like they don't understand someone who disagrees with them, or they're angry with somebody, or they're angry with us. It's not always clear what the pathway through that interaction is, but I feel like you absolutely can't go wrong if you do a thought experiment. If you say to them, okay, I, I know that you don't agree with that other person, or I know they're mad at you, or you're mad at them. Can you stand in their shoes? 
can you try to see where they're coming from? Maybe that will be a way that you can start to find some common ground. A little empathy goes a long way. Yes, it does. We'll have more information details for some of the stuff we talked about in the podcast in the show description, but I'll see you next week, Lisa. See you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to Lisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.